Okay. Well, welcome to another Wednesday, everyone. Is it truly another Wednesday, or is this a special Wednesday? I'm not sure. Depends on your perspective, I guess. But today's webinar is titled Building Science Innovations for Net Zero Energy Homes, Part 1. And it's brought to you by NV Energy. Yes, you heard me right. Just in time for the November sweeps, we're having a mini-series on building science innovations. And why not? It's constantly evolving as building products, systems, and practices become more efficient, durable, and resilient. Today, Steve Easley, our guest presenter, will identify products and approaches that are critical in the process of attaining net zero energy homes. He's also going to give us real world examples to help demonstrate cost effective methods to overcome the barriers of achieving high performance structures. We're also going to discuss the most problematic issues that builders are facing today. Finally, Steve will explore advanced products and solutions, the building science behind common performance failures, and problematic materials and building methods. Now, if you don't know who Steve Beasley is, I'm sorry to hear that. He's an internationally recognized construction consultant specializing in solving building science related problems and educating building industry professionals and their trade partners. His work focuses on increasing quality of construction, sustainability, performance, and reducing costly mistakes that lead to construction defects and those dreadful callbacks. Steve's mission is helping industry professionals build and remodel structures that are durable, energy efficient, healthy, and comfortable to live and work in. He has more than 30 years of industry experience, performing thousands of job site quality surveys and presenting building science seminars around the world with an annual audience of eight to 10,000 industry professionals, not including those who joined us today. Now, before Steve shares his wisdom with us, I need to tell you about PowerShift by NV Energy. You can never save too much energy or money. That's why NV Energy has introduced PowerShift to help its residential and business customers conserve even more energy and save money on their power bills. PowerShift by NV Energy is also about providing you with excellent customer service. It's your one-stop shop to find all the energy efficient products and services to help you boost your bottom line along with convenient ways to manage your account. PowerShift Energy Advisors are dedicated to working side by side with business customers to discuss their needs and to find energy efficiency solutions that save money. Plus, their Business Solutions Center is the place to go to discuss your bill payments and account related questions. For more information, please visit nvenergy.com slash PowerShift. Now, during today's presentation, you can submit questions for our guest. Simply use the questions box on the right side of your screen. I'll review those questions and pose them to Steve during the Q&A time set aside after his presentation. Steve, we're ready for you. Hey, thanks, Michael, and thanks, everybody, uh, for attending. Um, so um, first of all, um, we can make any home or building zero energy if we throw enough collectors on it, like this house here, 168 panels. But that's not really the, the goal. The goal is to use as much energy and then back it up with some enough renewable energy to um, create a zero energy home. It's really about efficient form and orientation. It's about sizing the systems right to the load. It's about a really good thermal enclosure best-in-class uh, reduction of plug loads and lighting, domestic hot water, and then finally, um, you know, top off with uh, the right amount of renewable energy. And so my talk today is really about how we can make structures really um, perform better from the ground up. Uh, for those of you that are interested in some resources, I've got some free resources for you. Um, number one, this is a guidebook that I participated in. It's called Guide for Designing Energy Efficient Building Enclosures. And uh, you can get that at uh, www.fpinnovations.ca, or if you go to steveasley.com and just click on the helpful resources, you can download it there. Um, and what's interesting about this guidebook, we put together tons of details about how to deal with insulation, flashing, uh, around in particular some of the more complex issues associated with how to deal with uh, exterior insulation, your drainage planes, flashing systems, your wall flashing, et cetera. So lots of good details, and it's, and it's all free. Um, so with that in mind, let's talk about what we're going to learn today. Um, number one, we want to understand the principles of integrated design and 
project uh, delivery, uh, understand those cost-effective technologies and systems for designing uh, zero energy home building as well. Uh, steps to ensure the best in class enclosure for insulation, air barriers, products uh, to offset PV demand, and understand some new approaches to advanced framing. Uh, understand some impacts of windows and the best technologies associated with selecting windows for, for your homes. And then, of course, maximizing HVAC performance. Great information you can also get at um, www.buildingsenergy.gov slash zero forward slash. And get lots of great information there from the Department of Energy through the Building America program. So what is integrated design anyway? You know, typically when we design and build houses, an architect comes up with a conceptual idea or design that's handed off to um, maybe a mechanical person that does, you know that bids on the system, and maybe somebody else decides on the insulation. It's not really a process where we look at what we're trying to create in terms of the goals of the house. So to truly get a high performance home, we want that to be healthy and safe to live in. Obviously, cost effective to build. We want it to be durable and long lasting. Um, like to be simple and to operate and very low maintenance. Obviously, we want it to be functional, comfortable, attractive to look at. And um, but that takes a lot of commissioning and uh, feedback through the process along the way to truly get an energy efficient, zero net energy home. So part of uh, the zero energy home success really depends on um, measuring the true performance of all the energy fissures along the way. Intermediate evaluations, not just waiting until the end and doing a home energy rating and just hope that you get there. It's really this process of uh, Q&A and inspections. So we don't simply rely upon modeling. We rely upon everybody in the field to make sure that the home is going to perform as modeled. So we're not assuming that trade professionals are knowledgeable and, and know what they're doing. We have to make sure that we educate everybody along the way and make sure we have good things in place to make sure that happens. So easy zero energy is really about thoughtful design and planning followed by careful implementation. Uh, we want to make sure that we have measurement and inspection processes that are phase by phase. So you want to have quality control and quality assurance. And it's not necessarily about whiz-bang technologies and ridiculous amounts of insulation really about all the parts of the home. A good example of this is a, a research home that I built when I was teaching at Purdue University back in 1985. This house was about uh, 2,100 square feet. Um, and um, if you're not sure where Purdue University is at, it's about two hours south of Chicago. It's a climate zone five, pretty cold climate. Temperature is well below zero in the winter and up into the 90s in the summer. This house had a um, a heating cost, an annual heating cost of about $135, and you could spend about $35 to $40 to cool this house. And this house is 30 years old, and it's still performing as well as it was the day that we built it. You know, we just paid very close attention to getting the insulation right, um, making sure that we did a good job of air sealing. Um, we paid very close attention to the building envelope. So, for example, from outside to inside, we had um, extruded polystyrene sheathing. And we did a lot of air sealing. As you see where all the, where all the uh, dots are here, that's where we did a good job of air sealing. And something that's a little different, um, you know, we basically made sure that all the wiring, all the plumbing, everything took place outside the building enclosure. In other words, we put furring strips up over our vapor retarder here, and all of our wiring and so forth took place outside of that insulated wall. So we never disturbed the insulation. So it's just really simple things that you can do. Like, for example, this was a passive solar super insulated house. So if you look on the left-hand side over here, you can see that we have a sun space. And the sun space was basically decoupled from the rest of the house by you know, glass walls. And so what would happen is we had a simple um, return air duct. And when the house called for heat, uh, if the sun space was warmer than the house, it would simply take air out of this sun space and circulate through the home. So in the, on the coldest days of the year, they're also the sunniest days of the year. And so what made that kind of work was the fact that um, we decoupled the space so we could store as much energy as we wanted to in here without overheating the house uh, in the more uh, less, less temperate months. Uh, then in the summer months, we simply had a cooling thermostat at this room got warm, it would simply take this heat out of the space and exhaust it out of the top of the attic space, and uh, so it left the home pretty comfortable. So you don't have to have a lot of whiz-bang, super efficient, uh, you know, spray foams and some of these types of things to make a home perform. It's really about putting the pieces together and making sure that you're paying attention to all the components. So when we talk about integrated design, it's really really, like I said, very thoughtful planning. So for example here, if you look at the way we typically do windows in a home and you see all the wood framing that we have here, 
we're doing some zero net energy homes that are costing very little uh, more to build. And some of the things that, for example, that we're doing, here's a, a section of a zero energy home that we worked on out in the Central Valley of California. And you'll notice here that uh, the studs are all 24 inches on center. You'll notice that um, you know, over the top we have a load-bearing truss that takes away the header. But, for example, here the window. You see that um, this window is framed in such a way, like, for example, a typical 4-foot by 5-foot window is 48 by 60. What um, the builder did in, in this environment was design a window to be 46 by 60 so that it didn't erupt our 24 inches on center framing, and we didn't have all of this tremendous amount of framing around the windows, which creates a lot of thermal bridging. So there are a lot of simple things you can do. And that's what we mean by integrated design. Now, what we don't mean by integrated design is, um, you know, like here, for example, this is actually off a set of plans where the air sealing system is lots of caulking. That's not what we're trying to accomplish. It's not just a matter of uh, just air sealing. It's a combination of all these things together. So integrated design means thinking ahead. Uh, for example, uh, instead of having drop ceilings like this, you simply put your drywall over your soffit so that you have a continuous air barrier that's easy to insulate and easy to seal. Whereas in conditions like this, it's very difficult to air seal this, it's very difficult to insulate, and it really, really adds a lot to the uh, air infiltration rate in the home. Another example of unintegrated design is when we just expect the trades to be able to figure out you know, where to run ductwork. And so, for example, here, because people didn't think things through, when the plumber comes in, he crushes the ductwork, and we can't get the type of airflow and comfort that we're trying to deliver, simply because the trades are making decisions instead of uh, designing these things in an advance. Today, we have great CAD programs that allow us to map out, for example, where our HVAC systems are going to run so that we don't have tradespeople um, the making decisions that impact the total energy performance of the building. So, for example, we can use products like this, trusses that allow us to run ductwork in places that we traditionally couldn't do that. So it's a matter of using these products to our advantage to make homes as energy efficient as possible instead of having to create issues in the field that cost us a lot of money and substantially reduce performance. A great example of this, this is a, um, a building that has um, a lot of collectors, and you notice here that they're facing, that, that they're actually almost vertical. But to top that off, they face north. So how in the world is this going to work? So you wonder, how can these things happen in the field? Well, it's because people are not well-trained or well-educated. It's not part of the process to make sure that we're looking out for these types of things. Another example, if you happen to live in the southwest, um, we oftentimes will buy uh, our HVAC systems based on their SEER rating. We really want to look at EER. Uh, which is basically um, the energy efficiency ratio, and it's more of a steady state measurement as opposed to SEER, which is a seasonal energy efficiency ratio that takes into account latent loads. But up here in the southwest, for example, when you look at this chart, you can see that if we look at the um, SEER ratings of 10, 12, and 14 SEER equipment, we can see if the outdoor temperature goes up, and once we start getting past about you know, 100, 100 degrees, we start to see these curves really come together. And when we're out here at, at you know, 115 degrees, you see that there's really no difference in performance uh, between a 10 sear and a 14 sear. So when we buy equipment, we want to buy based on their EER as opposed to their standard sear rating. So these are the kind of things we're talking about when we're talking about integrated design and project delivery. So the biggest reasons that I see why homes really don't perform as expected is that uh, they have high window-to-wall area ratios, uh, wrong glazing choices and poor orientation, um, high framing factors, uh, lots of thermal bridging, a pretty ineffective air barrier system, poorly installed insulation, the focus of insulation is primarily on the cavities, not the whole building envelope, um, poorly designed and installed HVAC systems, and of course, um, Oftentimes, hot water and lighting is, uh, is an afterthought. So orientation, for example, if you look at the shadow lines here, we can see this house has a, a one-foot rake and a two-foot overhang. But what I want you to pay close attention to is the shadow line. And then in this next example, we can see the infrared image that shows us just how hot these balls get. These surface temperatures can get upwards of, of close to 200 degrees. And so uh, this energy eventually makes its way into the home. So proper orientation. Um, overhangs, all those things are part of an integrated design process where we think all these things through in the beginning. 
A lot of my uh, talk today is going to focus on the building enclosure. And why we focus on the enclosure first is because it truly does reduce the heating and cooling loads, which are typically some of the largest energy users in, in the building. Um, it's likely, you know, these things last for the life of the structure. The energy savings don't diminish with age, um, reduces the uh, loads, thus reduces all the design risk factors associated with HVAC. Um, obviously, it, uh, you know, we want to manage and moisture and increase building durability. A lot of concerns today is that we make buildings more energy efficient, that we might potentially be creating moisture problems. As we add exterior insulation, for example, um, you know, we might be putting impermeable materials on the exterior of the building envelope, and so we have to be careful about how we, we manage uh, water and, uh, and moisture. And then finally, we definitely can enhance the comfort and indoor air quality by following uh, having a good building enclosure. So getting the enclosure really starts with thoughtful design. So what we want to try to do with a good enclosure, we want to manage water, moisture flow, air flow, heat flow, rating gain, and surface temperatures. As we, you know, increase the surface temperature, we have, have less issues for mold and moisture. Um, manage moisture as a vapor, and obviously sound control and fire separation. But what I'm going to focus on today is, uh, in, in addition, is or primarily is um, our four enclosure layers, which are water moisture management layer, our air barrier, which oftentimes is one of the same, like for example with the building wrap, our thermal uh, insulation, which can be in the cavities or on the exterior of the wall or both, and of course uh, vapor targets. Let's take a look at a typical house, and um, you know we think about we may have our 20 walls, but do we really? What's the most important component uh, to this wall? It's the windows. And what you're going to be surprised to see is what are the impact that windows have. Typically, residential windows uh, are about a, have about a 15% glazing factor. And what I mean by that is that if we have a, a thousand square feet of wall, 15% of that wall at a 15% glazing factor will be glass. So that means 150 square feet of that thousand square feet of wall are windows. So if we have a typical um, R, you know, double pane window, that would have an R value of about two. Well, if we even have a super insulated wall, say like an R30 wall, which is a pretty well insulated wall, our R30 wall drops to 10 if we have a 15% glazing factor. And again, that's pretty typical for today's homes. And if we put a window with a U factor of 0.25, for example, the R value of that R30 wall is cut in half. And even with the best windows money can buy, we're still in that uh, R19 range. So it's really important to understand the impact of windows and recognize that buying good, energy efficient windows are really critical to the overall performance. And that doesn't just mean U factor, it also means controlling solar gains. The amount of energy from the sun that strikes one square foot of glass or one square foot of surface is about 250 BTUs per square foot. So if I have even a sliding glass door, let's say that faces west, and it's, let's say six by seven, we'll make math easy, we'll say 40 square feet of glass, that's 10,000 BTUs per hour of cooling energy that's going to be required to offset those solar gains. So having good orientation, having good glass and windows, we can easily buy windows that have low solar heat gain coefficients uh, that can reject up to 78% of the sun's heat. So most of these window technologies really do not cost that much more. When you look at just the energy saving features associated with good glass, it costs about a dollar to a dollar fifty a square foot. So it doesn't really have to add that much to the cost of the structure. So when we look at windows, we want to be thinking about the frame, the insulated glass unit, and the spacer. And when you look at even the best windows that are recommended, for example, like Energy Star, if you look over here and we look at climate zones 5 through 8, and you look at the solar heat gain coefficient, and even in the uh, high performance home, they're saying you can use any glass and you would qualify potentially for Energy Star. But people have to realize that even in the colder climate zones, uh, we still have a lot of air conditioning load. Oftentimes, um, you know, we see climate zone 5, for example, we see the cooling loads oftentimes can cost more than heating loads, even though it's a predominantly heating-related climate it's considered. But typically, air conditioning costs can either overshadow even heat costs or easily equal to. So it's really important, important to pay attention to that glass. And it's not just the glass itself. It's the frame. It's the glass. It's the edge spacer. So for example, here you can see in this window um, where most of the heat loss is occurring is uh, around the spacer. So having a good spacer is important. 
So anytime that you buy Windows, you want to look for these three important things. You want to look for the U factor, uh, which is basically how well that window performs uh, in, in the winter months. The lower number is better, of course. And so, for example, this window conducts 0.35 BTUs per square foot of glass per degree of temperature difference between indoors and outdoors. So this basically tells us our conduction component of the heat loss or heat gain from our window. The solar heat gain coefficient is, um, in this window here, for example, is simply uh, 0.32 which means that's the percentage of heat from the sun that gets to the glass. So for example, uh, this window would, would let in about 32% of the sun's energy. For most parts of the United States, we don't want to see these numbers get above 0.25 for both the U factor and the solar heat gain coefficient. A lot of people get confused when they start building zero energy homes thinking that, well, I want to put high transmission glass on one side of the house and low solar heat gain glass, say, like on the east and west, but what we found is that as you get the building enclosure so efficient and the load so low, that in the swing months, like in the spring and the fall, a high transmission glass can actually cause the home to overheat. So as the home envelope gets more efficient, we want to make sure that we don't do things that cause the structure to overheat and drive up cooling loads. So if you were to look at the solar spectrum, for example, about 52% of the sun's energy is in the infrared spectrum and about 45 in the visible. Well, we want windows that let in lots of light, but we can block the heat because that's the invisible portion of the energy from the sun that is pretty easy to control with um, low heat coating. So for example, standard glass lets in about 90% of the sun's heat, whereas um, we typically rely upon tents and so forth, they do block some of the heat, but it's heat absorbing glass. So that energy eventually gets re-radiated into the home. But spectrally selective low heat glass, for example, low heat coatings have the ability to uh, reflect um, that infrared energy and makes us more home more comfortable uh, in the um, more comfortable in the uh, uh, winter months and uh, certainly in the summer. So if you look at this window, for example, um, we can see that um, we have a low-E glass on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we don't have any low-E glass. And um, if you look at this infrared image of me standing in back of the infrared camera, the heat from my body is reflected off the low-E coating and absorbed by the camera, where the low-E glass um, or the non-low-E glass on the right-hand side um, it really isn't, uh, isn't working so well. Um, so. Here's an example of a, a window, an infrared image of a window that has low E coatings on the um, left-hand side, and on the right side, we simply have clear glass. Now, what I want you to pay close attention to is look at the difference in the surface temperature. Um, the low E units on the left, they're much warmer, and so uh, the glass on the right is much cooler, so you're going to experience that as a, as a loss in comfort, both winter and in, in summer. Now, high transmission glass, like you'd use in a climate where you didn't have air conditioning, um, that lets in about 71% of the sun's heat. So that's designed to let in the heat from the sun. All load coatings work in the winter about the same. So in hot climates, for example, or climates where we have anywhere we have air conditioning, we would not want to use this type of glass. Where a low solar gain glass blocks about 78% of the sun's heat. So when we talk about medium and low solar gain coatings, this is what we're referring to. These low E coatings are nothing more than a microscopically thin silver coating that's in between the two panes of glass. And this does a pretty good job of, um, of keeping out the heat from the sun. So if you look at um, some properties of some typical windows, and if you look over here on the left, uh, we have double pane insulating glass is what we're comparing here. So this has, uh, this is the numbers for no uh, low E coatings, for high solar gain low E coatings, medium and low solar gain. So if we look at typical values that we see on the window labels, we can see that no low E coating has a U factor about 0.55 and that's in about 50% of the heat from the sun. A high solar gain coating has a much lower U factor, so it's going to have a R value of about 3, for example, um, but it lets in quite a bit of heat from the sun. Whereas if we look at the low solar gain products, like uh, here we see that the U factors of all these products are about the same, but look at the difference in the solar heat gain. This only lets in 22% of the sun's heat compared to 52 from the high solar gain clients. So the high solar gain products are the products that we want to use in climates where we have no air conditioning loads 
and the medium and low solar gain products are what we want to use uh, for most climates that, uh, where we have heating and air conditioning loads. So they have some new coatings that are out there now that allow us to get extremely low U factors. For example, this is a, a low E coating that has three low E coatings on the glass, so it's a very um, low uh, solar gain glass. Uh, it has a visible light transmission of about 66%, and it has um, low E argon, but it also has this iodine coating. What that basically is, that's a proprietary coating from Cardinal, but um, this coating is on the inside surface of the glass that you actually touch in addition to the low E coating. So it used to be these low E coatings were extremely fragile, and uh, you had to have them in between the panes of glass, but now they've, interviewed, they've, uh, they've introduced some of these coatings that can get the new factors of windows down in the 0.2 rate. So we're really come a long way with the best windows. And of course, don't forget the spacers. In the old days, we had spacers that were typically aluminum spacers. But with new warm edge technology, we have thermal breaks that take place between the glass and the spacer. Spacers are oftentimes stainless steel so that they conduct less. So a window that has no low, low or, uh, excuse me, a window that has um, no warm edge technology conducts a lot more energy around the perimeter than the warm edge technology does. So typically, these um, better spacers have got multiple seals so that we don't have issues with seal failures. And they do have low conductivity spacers that reduce this thermal bridge. And of course, for years, we've had argon gas. But just to let you know, the argon gas can have a, uh, a significant impact on the overall performance of the window. And people often ask, Does the, do these products leak out? And no, they really don't over time. If, if you have um, a window failure, you'll notice that because you get condensation between the pane and glass. And the beauty is with these types of technologies, you no longer need to rely upon um, triple pane windows. The problem with triple pane windows is that they really only reduce your conduction loss to very little to increase the performance of the window during the air conditioning season. So uh, with these new technologies, we can, we can go a lot further, be a lot more energy efficient. Another thing that's important to think about is solar gains, and particularly in attics. Uh, so being able to reduce solar gains in attics is really important because oftentimes in many climates we put our ductwork, our HVAC system in the attic, and uh, that can you know really reduce the overall efficiency of the total system. And that's because attics can get upwards of 140 degrees. So using radiant barrier technologies can make attics about. And if you have ductwork in your attic, studies have shown that um, you can increase the performance of your HVAC system by about 15% with um, these, these types of products. In the next webinar, I'm going to get into a lot of detail about HVAC systems and how we can design and install those so they perform much better. Because the goal is, in any zero energy house, is to kind of keep the ductwork outside of conditioned space. And so we're going to show you some innovative uh, ways that you can uh, install HVAC systems so that uh, they're outside of these heated attics or warm, very warm attics. Obviously, the surface temperature of building materials can have a big, or the, uh, excuse me, the color of building materials can have a big impact on the surface temperature. Uh, if you look at here, just the, um, the color of the shingles can change the temperature by close to 40 degrees. So using lighter colored roofing materials and wall materials are certainly helpful in terms of reducing solar gain. And then we have a whole series of cool roof technology products now uh, that are very good at reflecting the infrared uh, spectrum without having to be necessarily just light colors. So um, when we buy uh, cool roof technologies, we can go to the Cool Roofs Rating Council, and we can look at um, exactly how these products are rated to perform. So you don't necessarily have to have light colored building products if you use these cool roof uh, technologies. And as you can see here, they come in a variety of different uh, colors and so forth. So that really doesn't have to impact the aesthetics of the building. Now, in some parts of the country, like for example uh, in California, there, this issue associated with uh, solar gains and attics have driven the energy codes to basically start requiring under deck insulation. Um, so we not only have our traditional ventilated attic, but the codes are also pushing to get people to insulate the bottom of the roof deck. And that's because of the solar heat gain that occurs in attics. Now, we can do this with spray foam. We can do it with rigid insulation. Uh, or the most simplest solution would either to be a, a non-conditioned or to be a, a basically a non-vented attic. And I'll get into that in a little more detail later. But, um, or get the ducts out of conditioned space. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about some thermal performance factors. 
typically the framing factors of homes is about 25%. Uh, so that means if I've got um, a thousand square feet of opaque wall, 250 square feet is going to be insulated to the R value of the stud, which is about 4.35. So that means that um, only 75% of that wall is insulated to the R value of the insulation. So that has a big impact uh, with regards to uh, framing and wind washing, gaps in insulation, it makes it more difficult to insulate. I took this picture a few months ago on the job site, and this is typically how homes are framed. And what makes this really problematic is not only do we have a lot of thermal bridging, but it makes it very difficult for the insulation installers to install the insulation correctly. So we, don't, we want to employ advanced framing techniques because thermal performance is really a two-part process. It's about controlling conduction losses with insulation and reducing thermal bridging and about air sealing. So when you look at infrared images of a home, you can typically see where the thermal bridging occurs is at the stud and in the corners. Uh, when you look at this image here, everywhere that the frost is melted is where we have thermal bridging occurring. And so that's why the energy codes today are really pushing towards um, builders to use exterior insulation to reduce that thermal bridging that can take place from excessive amounts of overframing. When we look at traditional uh, construction, we see that we have a lot of heat loss through the studs, but as we add insulation over that, we reduce that thermal bridging. And so that creates some interesting questions about how we locate our drainage planes and our window flashing. So for example, here you can see that the weather barrier here is uh, building paper and our flashing and so forth is integrated into the system behind the exterior insulation. So you can put your, your weather barrier and your air barrier behind the exterior insulation, just going to make sure that all that water has a way to reach the exterior building envelope. So for example, here if you see um, our window flashing uh, in this case is behind our weather resistive barrier, but at the bottom of this window it comes out from underneath that and then it drains to daylight through these weep holes at the bottom. So it's pretty easy to employ exterior insulation without creating moisture problems. Now when you look at um, steel framing in some cases, for those of you that do commercial work, it's an even bigger penalty. If I have a 16 inch on center, even a 2 by 6 wall, that would have an R21 bad insulation, but the result of thermal bridging takes that wall down to about 7.4, so it's about a third of its intended R value. And when you add exterior insulation to wood frame construction, we see that a typical R13 wall would drop to about 10.7, but adding one inch of foam takes that up to um, about an R16. So using exterior foam insulation does make a lot of sense. Uh, we don't have to really worry so much about condensation behind this and trapping moisture because the insulation helps create a condition where the exterior sheathing is warm enough to where the relative humidity doesn't get above that 70% threshold, which is the threshold for mold to start growing. So if we can get water uh, away from the wall system, that reduces that potential. But the insulation, it does help reduce a lot of that thermal ridge. So again, um, you can, when the codes talk about R13, plus 5 or 20 plus 5, what they're really referring to, obviously, is this exterior insulation. And if you notice here, uh, the window's been bucked out, the flashing is tied into that. Uh, we have a weather barrier behind exterior foam. Um, we could do that another way. We could put the weather barrier and window flashing outboard of the foam insulation. And you want to follow some basic flashing details that are outlined in the new window flashing standards created by the Flashing Material Associate, Manufacturers Association, as well as AMA, which is the American Architectural Manufacturers Association. Uh, they've created these new window flashing standards, and you can go to AMA's website and you can download those. Uh, but basically, it's AMA 100 through 500, and um, they talk about all the different methods for integrating flashing in with your um, foam sheeting. In particular, the flashing standard that we want to follow for, uh, foam, uh, for foam, foam sheeting is AMA 500. Now, a few years back, the National Association of Home Builders, uh, through their Housing Innovations Lab, uh, they developed a kind of a unique approach to dealing with thermal bridging. Uh, what they did was is they built two by six walls uh, with plates and they used two by four framing and then balanced out the difference with two inches of foam. And what that looks like in the real world is our thinner studs that are two by six plates and then we have two inches of foam so that over the top of that goes our shear wall. And so our weather barrier and our traditional system is installed 
in a way that uh, it's always been. So you're not trying to deal with complex flashing and uh, detailing around weather assistive barriers. So it's kind of a clever approach. Uh, it may not work in high seismic areas, but certainly in some parts of the country we're not dealing with seismic load. This can be um, another alternative. Another approach that can help us in terms of reducing thermal bridging is to put our headers up uh, over uh, our walls parallel or perpendicular rather to our floor joists. So instead of all these you know, wood headers uh, that make it difficult to inflate air seal, we can basically move this header up above and tie it in with our floor joists so these loads are distributed there as everywhere we can insulate behind them fairly easily um, without um, having to deal with big wood headers and lots of thermal bridging at these header locations. Another approach that helps us in the area of this reduces thermal bridging, as I mentioned, is exterior insulation. So to kind of give you an example of how that might work in the rain screen wall, is we have, a, for example, here are two by six studs, a weather assistive barrier. We have mineral fiber uh, insulation over the top of that, which is very breathable. And then we have our uh, furring strips that are screwed through into the studs to support our cladding. So what that looks like in the real world is that gives us our space between the cladding and our weather resist or our insulation and our weather resistant barrier behind that so that our walls have the capacity not only to drain but also have the capacity to dry. So this is a really efficient wall system because it allows that wall system to have a good air barrier, good thermal insulation, and the capacity to drain and dry very quickly. Now, if you're interested in more information on advanced framing, you can download this free um, American Panel Association construction guide for advanced framing. Uh, you can get that at APA.org, and it's a, it's a free handbook that goes through all the little details that help us design and uh, build walls that uh, have less thermal bridging due to overframing. If you look at a conventional frame wall, for example, um, we've got, you know, typically close to a 25% framing factor, it's pretty easy to get that down to about um, a 13% framing factor. Now what's important is showing that all the plans, like a lot of my clients, what they'll do is they'll have CAD drawings done of all the stud locations on every wall. And that way the guy in the field, he understands where these studs are located and so we don't end up over framing and creating some of these issues. So we're doing two stud corners obviously, which some people do for years as opposed to a traditional wood block corner which has a lot of thermal bridge um, or openings over low bearing walls. So for example here, um, this is a, obviously a single story structure but what's important to note is we have one single top plate. Now this is an OSB engineered uh, top plate and these can be manufactured in length up to 60 feet. So what we did in this project is use these single top plates instead of standard double top plates and uh, they work extremely well at distributing the load so there's no difference in the overall structural performance of the home. We have a lot less thermal bridging. Now obviously we have to join those plates with um, metal ties where we do have seams and particularly where walls and so forth intersect. We don't do a lot of this standard framing where we uh, here, for example, we leave out this exterior stud right here and then we run our drywall continuous behind it so uh, we don't have uh, the thermal bridging there and then we put the last stud in over the top of that um, so that uh, we have no thermal bridging at those locations and then tie it together with uh, typical wall section plates like this. Here's an example of that of a project that we did out in the Central Valley of California where we use these OSB single top plates and then we tie it together with uh, with metal uh, plates so that we reduce a lot of the framing. Another thing we did on this project here is that in addition to these single top plates, we also use these engineered wood headers that are designed to be able to carry greater loads and so we don't have all, we can actually put insulation in behind here so that we don't have this complicated uh, header framing that we, you know, increases thermal bridging. Now typically with double top plates and the types of fasteners that we have to use for our roof tie downs, this creates a, a, another problem for us because as we put our drywall over the top of this, we get conditions that uh, create um, airflow that runs from behind the drywall up around these connectors and into the attic. So when we're looking at having um, lower door test numbers of less than two air changes uh, per hour, you know, you're not going to get there using these types of fasteners. So what we did in this project is that we use these long uh, truss fastening screws that are designed to go through um, the stud into the top plate and then we also go from the, in this case, a single top plate into uh, the truss. So we avoid those um, hangers that are expensive and additionally um, 
increase the air infiltration rate because they're very difficult to, to seal around. Another thing that we did was on the end walls is that we use load-bearing gable end trusses. And what that does for us is prevents us to have these headers here that would increase tumble bridging and difficult air seal around as well. Another thing that we like to do in our projects, instead of running our wiring uh, willy-nilly through all the stud bays, we basically drill holes at the bottom of the plate so that our wiring can run along the bottom so that when we put the insulation in, uh, our insulation is not uh, uninterrupted by, uh, or interrupted by lots of wiring and so forth. So more, it doesn't take a lot of you know, ridiculous amounts of insulation to make this work. It's about making sure the insulation is installed properly so we reduce airflow. Um, when we look at traditional insulation, our values range from, you know, roughly three and a half to eight per inch. And, um, you know, we can get tremendous amounts of insulation in our walls without having to spend ridiculous amounts uh, of money. So one of the things I want to point out is some factors that really have a big impact on the thermal performance is how that insulation is installed. And when you look at some work that Oak Ridge Labs did a few years back when they started looking at how insulation really performs in buildings, it's about because of the way it's installed, upwards of close to you know, a 30% reduction in overall performance. Even if you look at an R19 bat, R19 bats are about six and a quarter inches deep. And um, they are even perfectly installed. They perform at R17 because most of our studs that we put in buildings are five and a half. So that means when our R19 bat is compressed to five and a half inches, um, it drops about R13. Then when you look at the way it's installed, it's even much lower, closer to 14. That's because of all these compressions and all these issues associated with how the insulation is installed. Now this I think you'll find fascinating. This one of my colleagues, uh, Rich Chipwood, he built this knee wall and he put some uh, heat lamps behind it. And this wall has four different levels of insulation in each of the stud bays. It has a, um, one of the stud bays has an R11 bat, one of the stud bays has an R13, one has an R19, and one of the stud bays has no insulation. In it. Well, it's pretty easy to spot which stud bay here on the far right um, is not, uh, not insulated at all. But what you might be surprised to know, the stud bay that performs the best is the R11 that is perfect, the insulation is perfectly installed. When we look at sloppy insulation practices of our R19 bat here, for example, it really performs closer to about an R4 simply because the gaps, the cracks, the way the insulation is installed. So this is why um, we want to make sure that we follow um, simple insulation procedures that are basically best exemplified by the ResNet uh, insulation grading procedure. Um, they make sure that the insulation is installed in the way where there's no voids, no spaces, complete alignment with all of its air barriers. That means that that insulation touches the sheathing, it touches the drywall, it touches the bottom of the stud, the top of the stud, and it's basically installed uh, perfectly. Well, if you're looking for some good specifications, the ResNet standards for grading insulation is really good to follow. And grade one is what we want to make sure that we install the insulation to. That means there's very minimal uh, deficiencies. When you look at this wall here, the insulation is pretty well installed. So this is kind of our goal, to make sure that there's no gaps, cracks, voids in the insulation. Because what makes an insulator insulate is its ability to trap air. And when you compress the insulation, you lose its ability to trap air. Glass itself is not a very good insulator, but all the strands of the fiberglass that creates these air pockets reduce the flow of heat. So for example, when you look at spray foam insulation or even foam board sheathing, um, the reason it's a better insulator is because if you, say, take a piece of styrofoam and break off a little one-inch cube, that has over one million pockets in it uh, that are filled with a gas that's less conductive than air. So it makes it a better insulator. So when we're looking at grade one, as you can see here, these little black marks, uh, they're basically um, the maximum amount of voids that we can have to achieve the grade one. You look at grade two, it's quite a bit sloppier. Uh, this is what we see when we're looking at typical grade two, grade three installs, or that's what we oftentimes see out on job site. So what we need to do for to truly reach a, a zero energy home is that we need to make sure that this insulation is installed perfectly. So we want to do um, a couple of inspections. One, on the interior, before we do insulation, we want to make sure that the house is completely sealed. We want to take our sealing drywall uh, and install that, and air seal around the perimeter, do a blower door test before the insulation is installed so we have a chance to go through and air seal all of these, um, all of these components. And then we install the insulation, do another inspection, 
um, and then um, proceed. But these things have to happen before drywall is installed, otherwise you're never going to get the kind of performance out of a, of a home that you're truly expecting. And this is the kinds of things that we see on job sites and day to day that truly do reduce the performance of buildings. Owens Corning, for example, they have a guide, a guide book that's called Achieving Grade 1 Insulation. For you architects out here, this has got some great language in here that will help you with your specifications. And uh, these are the types of things our insulation contractors should be aware of and employing these techniques when they install the insulation. Instead of waiting until the drywall's in, you do the blower door test and you do the infrared scans and you find out the building is not going to perform as intended. Another great example is the thermal enclosure uh, rater checklist. This is a whole series of uh, diagrams and details that help us avoid a lot of the common pitfalls that we see in traditional home construction, like drop ceilings, like we see here on the left, drywall, before um, these drop ceilings and soffits are installed, making sure that you know we solve a lot of these uh, air barrier issues before the drywall is installed. This checklist does a pretty good job of helping us get there making sure that we don't compress the insulation. Anything we can do in our design process to keep plumbing on interior walls as opposed to exterior walls is going to really help us uh, achieve the performance that we're really looking for in homes instead of traditional wiring like we talked about earlier where you know you can simply drill holes or v-notch the bottom of the studs and run our insulation there as opposed to trying to deal with all the compression and so forth that deals uh, that ruins the R value of insulation in the field. Uh, it's also important where we have unbraced walls that require um, thicker studs than they are maybe that we're using insulation to fill. Um, we're required to fill those cavities. For example, here you see that we have an R13 bat, a 2x6 wall. Well, because fibrous insulation is not a very good air barrier, uh, we're going to have a lot of thermal siphoning and a lot of wind washing that can take place to substantially reduce the overall performance of that. So we want to fill those cavities. So in addition to massive amount of um, performance issues associated with thermal bridging, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that if we don't have a good air barrier system, the insulation is also not going to perform up to par. This is a graph that was uh, generated by data from um, a company called Holometrics that did some actual real-world testing of how insulation performs in, in the real world. Um, what we're seeing here is an R14 wall, and then as we increase the wind speed across the wall, what they did was they built an eight-foot tall wall about 12 feet long. Uh, they depressurized that wall as to different wind speeds, and they found that the R value of the insulation diminished dramatically. Uh, as wind blew across the wall. So for example, even at a five mile an hour wind speed, our R14 wall ended up dropping to about R8. So it's a big hit because of air flowing across the insulation. Just like um, you could have the best sweater money can buy, but uh, you go skiing, the sweater's not going to perform very well as you're flying down the mountain because of the air infiltrating through that, carrying away heat or scavenging heat. So having a good air barrier system is really critical, not just to reducing the air infiltration rate of the home, but also substantially enhances the, uh, in, you know, the R value of the insulation. So here's an example of the thermal image that I took of a house that had R11 baths completely filling the cavity. And I put a blower door on this home, and I depressurized the house to about 50 pascals, which is equal to about a 20 mile an hour wind blowing across the home. And what I want you to look at here is that if you look at the, um, the infrared image, the darkest colors are the area of greatest amount of heat loss. This is where the cold air is infiltrating in. So if I look at the center of my wall up here and I look at the center of my floor, we can see that they're both the same temperature. But as air infiltrates in along this plate line, and these are, these are the studs, this is an outlet, this is a corner, and uh, as air infiltrates in around this sheathing, up between the sheathing and the plate and underneath the plate, look what happens to the, um, the effective R value of the insulation. It drops substantially. So not only are we dealing with the impacts of thermal bridging, the impacts of air infiltration pushing out the air you pay to heat cool, it also significantly diminishes the overall um, impact of the insulation. So we see this insulation operating at a less than a third of its total R value simply because of wind washing or air infiltration running across uh, the insulation. So whether you use fiberglass or whether you use cellulose or whether you use blown fiberglass or spray foam, it's really important that all these products get installed carefully. Um, so I think I'm 
pretty close to being out of time, but I would like to take a couple minutes to talk a little bit about spray foam. Uh, we have both open and closed cell spray foams. They both can be good products. Um, not necessary to use spray foam to build a zero energy home, but it certainly helps us a lot with regards to air sealing and insulation. Um, oftentimes people don't understand the difference between open and closed cell foam. So if you look at the actual chemistry, it's about the same. Uh, but open cell foam, the blowing agent is water. And when they mix the water with the part A and the part B chemicals in the foam, it creates a very violent reaction. The CO2 gas is formed and it causes the foam uh, to rise and sort of almost kind of tear itself apart and you end up with these large open cell structures. Well, with closed cell foams, they use um, blowing agents that create smaller bubbles, uh, so you have greater R value, and those bubbles are filled with a gas that's less conductive than air. Um, so you end up with um, you know, much higher R values. Typically the R values of um, open cell foam are about uh, three and a half to four and a half, and the R values of closed cell foam uh, are anywhere from um, six to almost eight. Now, it's important to recognize when we look at the global warming potential of these products, they can be high. I mean, you're looking at the global warming potential of um, just CO2 gas is one. When you look at the global warming potential of, of let's say, closed cell spray foam, for example, it can be upwards close to 1,500. But now they have uh, new blowing agents. Um, that, like for example, Honeywell developed a blowing agent called Solstice, and these products have uh, global warming potentials down in the five range instead of you know 11, 12, 1500. So with that in mind, I guess I should stop and uh, take some questions. Next time we'll get into a lot more detail on air sealing uh, examples and uh, how we can develop building envelope details that make it easier to air seal, as well as non-venom addicts, and uh, then spend a lot of time on um, HVAC systems, uh, both design and uh, installation. So with that in mind, Michael, I guess I'll pass this back over to you, and um, we'll take some questions. Great. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And like, like you said, if you've got questions, go ahead and send those in. There's a question box over there on the right side. At least I think it's on the right side of your screen. Maybe it's in the middle, maybe it's in the left, but it's there for you to send questions our way. First one I wanted to send to you, Steve, was something from Robert. He wanted to know, have you ever seen or do you have any experience at all with the heated glass windows? I don't have any experience with that, um, but I can say that um, any time that we start I will say this, there are some exciting things happening in the window technology arena. Uh, some of the manufacturers that have taken um, or experimenting with some of the technologies that was used for um, inkjet printers in our, for our printers, and they're able to make uh, I think what they call like electronic uh, ink that has the ability to uh, change the opacity of the window. Typically when we're looking at products like sage glass and some of these glasses that uh, can reduce solar gains, they can cost hundreds of dollars per square foot. These projects will cost, our products will cost dollars per square foot. You know, square foot. So we see some exciting things coming down the pike. The advantage of heated glass obviously would be more valuable in cold climates. Um, our bodies radiate heat at the to the fourth power, so um, when we stand in front of a standard window on a cold day, our bodies are radiating heat very quickly to those colder surfaces. So the value of a heated glass product, if you can afford it, is the fact that that surface temperature is going to be closer to your body temperature, so you're going to experience uh, much greater comfort. Um, but in terms of probably overall savings, in terms of what that would generate for you, um, you know, I, I, I would question uh, the cost of it, and if you can make the math work, um, then I would certainly encourage it. But the downside is, obviously, you've got to run electrical power to each of these windows. I'm going to keep it on windows for just a second, uh, Steve. I got a question. You were, you were mentioning the coatings for those windows um, earlier in the presentation. What is the expected lifespan of those products? You know, they really don't wear out. I can tell you that, in general, the window industry um, expects windows to last for about 25 years. Uh, some of the window manufacturers will guarantee the insulated glass units against seal failure for upwards of uh, 10 to, you know, all the way up to 25 years in some cases. Um, but the coatings really don't wear out. Um, again, these coatings are just a microscopically thin layer of silver that goes on the glass, and it's reflective to that infrared portion of the spectrum that is heat. And so they really don't wear out. Um, 
that's one of the reasons why they put argon gas between the panes of glass of a window. It's not only because uh, the argon is a little denser than the air and it creates a, an environment where you have less thermal siphoning or air turning over in between the two panes, but also argon and krypton, they're uh, a family of gases which are called uh, noble gases or inert gases, and what they mean by that, um, they're not reactive gases. So for example, if you look at oxygen, for example, it's a very reactive gas. Uh, it's very corrosive. That's what causes corrosion and what causes rust. When you look at your grandmother's you know, silverware, um, it gets tarnished and black. Well, that's because the silver oxidizes. So so when they put those inert gases in between the panes of glass and seal that environment, that really reduces the potential for those coatings to deteriorate over time. Now the coatings, the silver coatings also have other coatings that are put on the manufacturing process that protect, protect them, but um, the inert gases in between the panes of uh, glass also help that as well. And there's of no course, you get slight degradation there. Yeah, there's no, I mean, uh, when you look at, if you're, um, yeah, the, the ultraviolet light, these types of things, really doesn't impact the life of a low-E coat because they're silver. And uh, they do have anti-reflective coatings, much like the, the coatings that you have on your glasses. You might say, well, geez, if three low-E coatings are good on a window, why not put 12? Well, the more silver you add to the glass, the more reflective it becomes. So people start to see their reflections in the glass. So what we try to accomplish in window manufacturing is where we not only put the silver coatings on the glass, but we also put these anti-reflective coatings, much like the anti-reflective coatings you have on your eyewear, to reduce uh, those potential for uh, reflection. Okay. I want to switch it up a little bit to um, a question from Bob. He wanted to know, can the single one and a half inch OSB top plates, can they allow trusses to be placed in locations other than directly over the stud? Um, that would be a manufacturer by manufacturer question. I personally wouldn't recommend it. Um, OSB is typically not as stiff as um, traditional wood framing, so my might be um, I think it would be unlikely that you could uh, locate those um, trusses anywhere but over stud. I mean, one of the advantages of uh, advanced framing is you're transferring the loads from the truss to the plates, to the studs, to the floor joists, you know, down to the foundation. So I wouldn't think that manufacturers would allow that, but that might be a case-by-case -case basis for the manufacturer. Excellent question. I think what's remarkable about these OSB plates is you can get those up to 60 feet long, so you're not dealing with um, all the splices and so forth that you would traditionally have to deal with in single power plate construction. We, uh, you know, I want to stay with the studs just for a second because I noticed one uh, on the slides where you were talking about how you would drill the holes and, and the chases near the bottom of the stud. Um, you're not compromising seismic integrity in any way, are you? Um, no. As a matter of fact, this was um, th this structure was built right in here in the Central Valley of California. So um, you'll notice some of you might have been sharp enough to notice that we have. Um, these little metal plates here. This was an ingenious um, uh, invention by the builder. Uh, what he discovered that if he could put his OSB, uh, he would run, you know, instead of four by eight sheets of OSB running vertically, he would run them horizontally. And then where the seams came together between the OSB, he put these metal um, uh, channels. And he would flatten out the metal channels where I'm showing you here where it meets the stud so they'd be flat. And so that would give you uh, you know, even better uh, uh, shear support in, in seismic conditions like that. But no, you, uh, uh, there's not a, not a huge issue, in my opinion. Gotcha. Uh, a question from Guillermo, and, and I've heard this question before. Um, it was raised, I think, in one of the previous code cycles, maybe the 15 code. Um, he wants to know, do any of the spray-in foam products create poisonous fume issues basically you know, uh, harmful off-gassing in the event of a fire? Uh, well, they certainly could. I mean, typically your spray foam has a, you know, they basically have a class 25 rating, so they're not really any, necessarily any more flammable than wood, but definitely the off-gassing during a fire is, is significant. Now, the point that I think is, once you get to a point where this stuff is combusting, uh, you're probably not going to to hate to say this, probably not going to be alive anyway. So, um, but yes, I mean, uh, anytime you burn, you know, plastic, it can give off, um, you know, significant, um, you know, 
off-gassing their fumes. Now, with regards to off-gassing, the good news is uh, not in the fire, but most of the spray foam products, um, most of the off-gassing occurs in the first few hours, and within 72 hours, there's very, very little off-gassing. I mean, polyurethanes have been in our cars, our car seats, or pillows, or couches, cushions, uh, they've been around us for, you know, 50 plus years. So the, the, the material itself is not necessarily um, an issue after uh, the initial off-gassing has occurred. But yeah, I wouldn't want to breathe the stuff in a fire, that's for sure. Right, and, and that's that's when I remember it coming up was, was about three years ago, and it was in regards to uh, first responder safety. That was where this issue was coming up. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so I got another question for well, you. Oh, I would like to say this, in terms of the first responder safety, when you look at the contents inside of a home, there are, and that's why firemen have air packs, and that's why we have egress requirements on our windows, and a fireman can get through a window with a complete air pack on. Um, you know, there's so many chemicals inside of our furnishings of a home um, that would be, you know, far more of a significant issue in my mind than spray foam insulation. Right, right. Uh, I had another question for you. Um, you talked about roof color, and it's important, and you documented that well. But have you seen any difference on the materials, meaning a difference between asphalt shingles versus metal or rubber or some other alternative roofing material? Well, actually, it's not so much about the material as it is about how that material is um, engineered into the system. So, for example, um, you might think that metal roofs are actually would be a poor performing product, say, than an asphalt roof. Well, the reality is metal roofs can actually be a little bit cooler, and a lot of that is due to the fact that metal roofs have air spaces underneath them. Or you look at uh, concrete tile roofs or bolted tile roofs, they actually have lower surface, or they have lower uh, temperatures at the roof deck because of basic ventilation. So if you could um, ventilate the bottom of your shingles and some metal roofing products do that, some tile roofing products do that, you end up with uh, quite a bit less heat gain uh, into the roof deck. So what happens is the radiant energy from the sun, remember that 250 BTUs per square foot, takes down on their roofing materials, that gets absorbed into the roofing materials and then re-radiated into the attic. So if I could create even the smallest airspace from underneath my shingles to allow some basic ventilation, uh, that system is going to work really well because heat always moves from warmer areas to colder areas and so um, it basically creates a natural draft effect which helps uh, cool that roof bed. wanted to remind people to go ahead and submit their questions over in the questions box and over a little bit past the top of the hour but Steve has been gracious enough to say that he can stick around a little bit longer, sure. so we want to make sure we get to your questions. So make sure to send those in. Speaking of which, uh, Bob's got another question. Uh, you, he says, you kind of led us to think earlier that triple glazing wasn't necessary, but what about in climate zones five through eight? Um, well, I can tell you, uh, if you go through, and this is the beauty of the NFRC label, um, you know, it really it doesn't. NSRC, NFRC label doesn't tell us whether it's a good window or a bad window, but it certainly tells us what the new factors are, which helps us determine you know what the biggest bang is for the buck. And it's not that uh, triple pane windows don't reduce um, you know heat loss; they do. It's just that their cost is so prohibitively expensive. So, for example, when you add that extra glass. You add thickness, and most importantly, you add weight. So when you look at the difference in U factor, for that few points difference in U factor, uh, to go to a triple glazed product, um, you know, it, it's hard to get that to be cost effective and pay for itself because it pushes up the cost of the window so high. So when you look at, for example, that I-89 coating um, that I, I talked about, and you look at the fact, the U factor uh, of that, it was down in the uh, 0.2 range. Let me go back here quick, and I'll, I'll show you. Um, yeah, so if you look at a double pane, low E window, um, just standard double argon, that's 0.24, but if I go to an argon filled low E window with that additional low E coating on it, I can get that down into 0.20 at a fraction of the cost of what a triple pane window would cost. So I might be able to get down maybe with a triple pane window, you factors maybe like maybe 
you know, two, 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 three, maybe. But um, and I would have to put low E coatings on all the glass uh, to get close to, you know, get down into this range. And so this is going to be, it's not that I'm against triple frame windows, and just what's the most cost effective. And as a follow up to uh, you're cutting out on me. Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, I can now. You cut out on me for a minute there. Okay. Sorry about that, Steve. Uh, <laughs> yeah. David had a follow-up question. Uh, you talk a lot about glazing and the window-to-wall ratios. Is there a quantifiable yes. effect for solar orientation on overall performance? Um, yes. And the you may have heard me say at the beginning of the hour, we don't want to rely 100% on modeling because models are, in my opinion, the purpose of models uh, are to give us an indication of where it's cost effective for us to spend our money. And so if you can, uh, the beauty of having a good orientation, which is very quantifiable, by the way, and through the models, and these models are uh, very inexpensive uh, these days, some of them are even free. Um, but um, they can give us exactly what those quantifiable, you know, cost savings are. What I like about getting a good orientation and overhangs is that when you obviously the southern orientation allows us to get solar gains when the angle of the sun is lower in the winter to help us heat our home. But yet, you know, the summer months the angle of the sun is higher, and so we're shielded by overhangs, so we're not overheating the house. Um, the beauty of a good enclosure, it makes those things less important. So as we start to get exterior insulation, we start to get you know, a better building envelope in terms of windows and air sealing and so forth, the impact of that is, is certainly, certainly less. But I think what's important to recognize is that these models can really help us uh, determine the value of that. When you're looking at, when you're looking at east and west facing glass, uh, particularly in the summer months, they're just the kiss of death. Uh, because the days are so much longer, and and um, the angle of the sun is such that you know we're going to get a lot of lot of heat gain through east and west orientations. Like I said, you know a typical sliding glass door was going to see almost 10,000 BTUs of hour of heat gain. A ton of air conditioning is 12,000 BTUs per hour. So if we have a smaller home, um, or let's say it's got a three-ton air conditioner, that's a third of our total cooling load. It's just solar gains through. Uh, glass. So we're looking at uh, climates like Arizona, Nevada, California, New Mexico. It's not uncommon at all to see 40% of our design cooling load be solar gains through glass. So being able to reduce that east and west orientation certainly reduces our cooling loads as well as peak loads. Okay. Last call for questions as we move to uh, a different Robert's question. Um, he wanted to know if the same uh, zero net energy solutions that you highlighted today apply to commercial properties like office or multifamily or industrial buildings. Oh, they, they certainly do. Um, when you look at commercial buildings, they have blazing factors on average of you know easily 25 to 40 percent, and so they absolutely do. I mean, commercial buildings are super leaky. Um, you know, we're starting to see new standards for air barrier standards for commercial buildings. Um, I highly encourage you to go to the Air Barrier Association of America. They've got a lot of the great data on dealing with uh, air barrier technologies and protocols for testing and so forth. But absolutely, the same principles apply whether it's commercial or residential. And in fact, in commercial buildings, um, you know, there's obviously quite a bit of opportunity for energy savings there. Commercial buildings are a lot more complicated because they're usually built with concrete and steel, which are more conductive, and um, lots of opportunities for air leaks. So absolutely. If you go to that, those guidebooks that I pointed out at the beginning of the hour, um, I'll if you go back to there and show those to you again. Um, they're, they're free. Um, they're typically about $100 books, uh, but you can download these for free. Um, and they get tons of information in there about dealing with um, certain wood frame commercial buildings. Okay. Uh, Clay's got a question uh, on cathedral ceiling. Should you use a moisture barrier on the warm side or not? Oh, good question. Um, actually, I'm going to kind of get into that a little bit when we get into the section on non attics next week. Um, but the code actually does address that in certain climate zones. 
If you're dealing with open cell spray foam insulation, for example, the code requires that you have an impermeable barrier applied to that. Open cell foam is very, very vapor open. In other words, it's very easy for moisture-laden air to permeate through that. And when it comes in contact with the you know, cold roof deck, it gets absorbed into that roof deck, and then you get changes, expansion, and contraction. And eventually, if that open cell foam delaminates, then you've got an airspace where you potentially could get condensation, and then that leads to a whole succession of failures. Um, closed cell foam has a uh, permeability over two inches. It has a permeability of less than uh, one, which meets many of the code requirements for vapor retardant. Um, so closed cell foam, you never have to worry about where you put it. Open cell foam in the very cold climates, I, would, I, I probably would not use open cell foam in climate zones five and, uh, and above um, on a non-vented attic or on a roof deck because it's just too vapor open. You need to apply some type of a, uh, a vapor barrier over the top of it. Where closed cell foam, you just don't have to worry about where you put it because it's, it's a vapor barrier at over two inches thick. I'm going to cover a lot of this on non-vented attics next week and kind of go through the science about that. Because even in hot humid climates, you have to be thoughtful about using certain types of foam insulation. Well, that sounds like a great place to stop for today uh, as a nice teaser for next week's part two. Uh, I want to thank you, Steve, certainly for sharing your time, your knowledge with us today. I also appreciate the audience for attending and asking all those wonderful questions. And finally, thank you to Envy Energy for their generous sponsorship of this webinar series. So thank you, Steve. I really much appreciate it. Any last words for us? Uh, well, um, I've got lots of um, free information on my website. You can go to uh, under articles and publications. You can download. I don't ask for your email or anything like that. Just go to steveeasley.com, and you can um, click on publications. and. Uh, you can download a lot of articles. If you go to the helpful resources, you can download these these other books that I've worked on. One is the CLP handbook, uh, cost and timber handbook that is designed for commercial buildings. And we wrote the building science, or co-authored the building science chapter of that. So there's good information about moisture management there as well. So. All right. We will see you back here one week from today for part two of this series. Go ahead and mark it down in your calendars, November 16th, 2 p.m. Eastern time. As Steve said, he's going to be looking at how changing energy codes are going to impact home performance. We're going to discuss cost-effective practical solutions that you can employ to meet these shifting requirements. I hope you'll come on back next week for the rest of this wonderful discussion. Until then, so long for now. <laughs>